Hello, friends, comrades, and interested others. You may be surprised to see two videos from me in a week. I am trying to get back on track a bit with my production schedule, if I can call it that. Um, but this probably won't be a normal thing, but I just like was in the YouTube mode today uh, and wanted to make this video. So you may be a bit thrown off by the title, because um, as many people know, if you look at my channel, if you've been following me, um, I have been, I am and have been a vocal anti-fascist for several years now, um, and that hasn't changed. Uh, I still do identify as anti-fascist in my politics, um, but I do think that, you know, a measured critique um, and a constructive and loving critique of the anti-fascist movement is warranted and is something that is maybe not often expressed enough um, in our movements because we often can get very defensive of ourselves and the organizing that we're doing um, and feel like critique is in bad faith or not constructive or that it like undermines the movement somehow but honestly like um, you know good faith internal criticism is like extremely important for any movement building to make sure that we're you know moving in the direction that we want to be moving in and developing and um, all that good stuff. And so I wanted to just discuss a few criticisms that I have had of the anti-fascist movement and um, in my time organizing in this, as an anti-fascist. I spent two or three years doing frontline anti-fascist organizing in Toronto and I'm no longer so directly involved in uh, frontline organizing, partially because I no longer live in the city, partially because um, I have disabilities and other issues. Um, that kind of made me redirect my efforts to more education stuff and partially because honestly like the anti-fascist work in Toronto wound up um, clearing out most of the overt street level fascist organizing that had been going on there so street level fascist organizing in Toronto is like not as actively a thing as it was in late 2016 to 2018 um, but yeah that being said um, some critiques that I have of the anti-fascist movement based on my experience in Canada specifically. Um, and again, these are not like, I'm not saying if you are an anti-fascist that you are necessarily guilty of these things, or I'm not trying to say that every person involved in the anti-fascist movement or every organization um, is guilty of these things, but these are just things that I've personally seen or experienced or perpetuated myself. Um, in my time being involved in the movement, uh, and I just wanted to, you know, name some of those things to shed some light on internal conflicty type stuff. Um, so this is all, you know, intending to be productive and in good faith. That being said, um, so while anti-fascists, uh, claim to be and pride themselves on being by, for, of their own communities, there is at times a tendency to parachute which is when you basically like drop down into another community or a section of your own community that you're not super actively involved in and then start doing stuff and trying to help um and so a couple examples that i can think of of this are um i remember hearing about the red guard in austin who um hung a dead pig head off a library that they said um, was like hosting anti or was hosting like neo Nazi events, and they got the wrong library, um, and that was like really bad optics, obviously, and very negatively like impacted the effective community, the affected community because they did not do effective research um, into the people involved or the organizations involved in the issue that they were actually organizing around. And so that kind of gets into my second critique, which is that I feel like anti-fascists um, oftentimes do not um, put enough of an effort into narrative development, um, like basically like promoting the story and kind of like explaining themselves as to why they're doing what they're doing. Um, a lot of anti-fascism can at times lean honestly to a bit towards self self-righteousness that they kind of just think that their actions are self-explanatory, that anybody who's on the side of justice will understand uh, why they're doing what they're doing, and that leads at times to actions which may appear to the general public to be overzealous or inappropriate, um, and then kind of like not explaining. Like, I feel like it's very 
core and essential to any direct action that you issue a communication explaining um, what the action was in response to, what the logic behind it is, who was consulted, like the effects of like the, the desired outcome of the action, um, to really like have that narrative out there because especially when we're existing in a political climate that has such a, um, you know, a media agenda explicitly against anti-fascism, like the United States president has declared anti-fascism as like a terrorist organization despite the fact that it's not an organization it's an ideology and the criminalization of an ideology is like inherently you know leaning towards fascistic um but yeah so when we're existing in this media context that has a highly vested interest in the discrediting of the anti-fascist movement, it is all the more important that we control our own narrative um, and that we, you know, make sure that we are communicating with the public around the meaning and implications of our actions. And I feel like um, at times anti-fascist organizations and actions have neglected to do that. Um, so that's my second big criticism. Um, the other thing is that Anti-fascists often feel like street-level opposition of overt white supremacy is pretty much all the anti-racism work that they have to do. Um, and because of that, there's often a neglect of internal anti-racism work and education work. Um, white anti-fascists especially often don't properly educate themselves on class struggle, on black liberation, on anti-colonialism. And because of that, there often can be actually a lot of unchecked internal racism in majority white anti-fascist groups. Um, and that's often something that people are not super, that can be something that people are not super receptive to criticism of, um, which obviously like is a very, um, a very effective or affective, like something that has a big effect on, um, you know, how we're doing this work and like whether the work that we're doing is actually effective and so internal anti-racism work and internal education work is actually like very very essential and i'm at the point where i actually don't feel like people should be involved in street level organizing if they have not um at least begun a process of internal anti-racism self-education or participating in some sort of community anti-racism education initiative um and so yeah, talking about the street level opposition piece and like the priority or, you know, over prioritization of that. Um, while there is this phrase like diversity of tactics that's like frequently used um, in like describing anti fascist tactics, there is like very undoubtedly this like machismo um, that winds up prioritizing combat over other forms of community building and care work and long-term de-radicalization efforts, which is like the big thing that I want to focus on. Um, and like this kind of thing that like, like violence or physical confrontation is inherently justified, you know, deplatforming and frontline work is inherently justified and is in inher inherently the most valuable form of activism that a person can do that's kind of like the mentality um without really fully appreciating that the presence of overt fascism um and overt street level fascism is a symptom of a deeply unhealthy community and a deeply unhealthy set of community relationships and that actually repairing those relationships um is the more essential piece to um dissuading and demotivating and you know disempowering disbanding street level fascist organizing as well as other forms of racism and fascistic organizing. Um, evidence shows that, um, and man this guy's name is like not coming to me off the top of my head but I am going to put it in the description, but I know that there was a black man in the south in America who like single-handedly wound up disbanding like multiple different KKK organizations and had single-handedly um, de-radicalized like dozens if not hundreds of people and then indirectly that effect really spreads out through a method of relationship building. Um, and so evidence has shown that relationship-based approaches are actually the most effective way to de-radicalize white supremacists and even former um, white supremacists like de-radicalized white supremacists um, have said that street level confrontational anti-fascism did not play a role in their de-radicalization 
it almost always, if not always, came through the form of relationship building and conversations and things like that. And white anti-fascists especially are in a particularly advantageous position to be doing that kind of organizing. Um, but despite the fact that there's this kind of idea that, you know, we'll combat fascism through any means necessary, there's kind of this implication that, um, you know, those unfortunate but necessary means are going to be violence rather than the unfortunate but necessary means being a series of uncomfortable conversations over the course of many years. Um, and I'm not, like, none of what I'm saying is to get to the point of saying that street level, um, you know, frontline direct action is not necessary. I feel like at times it is very necessary when it comes to that. But I feel like the focus on that as being the sole focus of the anti-fascist movement or um, you know, the primary focus of the anti-fascist movement, um, I think is problematic. Um, and I don't say problematic to be, like, toxic or wrong, but I mean, it's a problemed thing. And, uh, yeah, I feel like it actually winds up, you know, endangering POC or people of color ultimately when we refuse to do that, like, actually sometimes more challenging internal work, um, and interpersonal work of de-radicalization because that involves a lot of patience. It involves a lot like being able to be non-judgmental um, in relationship to someone who you like adamantly disagree with and whose opinions you find extremely offensive. Um, there's this kind of tendency to equate, um, you know, no platforming with just not having any interactions or conversations with conservatives or reactionaries at all. Um, and that's something that I take issue with as well, because a, a conversation without a platform, or a conversation without an argument, or sorry, what am I trying to say? A conversation without an audience is not a platform. Um, a conversation is a conversation until there's an audience. And if you are, you know, no platforming someone in that you're preventing someone from spreading fascist propaganda to an audience, then that is obviously valid and that's in keeping with the anti-fascist philosophy but when you're like i'm not gonna have a conversation with my racist uncle because no platforming that is a total misapplication of that tactic um and it's actually you're misusing that tactic as a way of opting out of your own responsibilities as a white ally um which is primarily in the education and accountability of other white people and so yeah i take a lot of issue with white anti-fascists really strongly kind of like playing into white exceptionalism of like even though they may not say it there's this vibe of like we are the good white people um and they're the bad white people and we have nothing to do with them we have nothing in common we have no social status or interests in common um and so i'm going to like combat these people um through every means necessary often being the most abrasive and combative means accessible um and there's not really a critique of like what that does for the individual that it can at times actually be very self-serving to you know reinforce your own sense of identity as a good person um and to distance yourself from the racism of other people which makes you feel uncomfortable or insecure about your own identity as a white person or insecure or uncomfortable about the the things that you actually do have in common that all white people have in common with other white people um regardless of their political ideology just based on our you know material and social position in the world so um yeah just like not effectively engaging in de-radicalization work and not effectively engaging in the education um the patient education and long-term education of other white people is like probably my biggest criticism actually um and so, yeah, like, by the same token, anti-fascists tend to take, um, or tend to frame physical confrontation as, like, the pinnacle or most effective, um, or most desirable form of direct action and dismiss nonviolent forms of direct action as liberal or passive or less radical. Um, and that's, like, actually a very dangerous thing that I feel like, and I've personally seen this, um, like, this is a critique that I've heard before, and it's also something I've per personally witnessed, of people basically feeling like because they are doing the frontline work, they are above criticism from other people in the movement, and that, you know, people who aren't doing the work in the sense of doing the exact same type of work that they are doing 
are somehow less invested, um, that their work is less meaningful or less impactful, and that they do not um, have a position to criticize people who are doing frontline organizing. And that is definitely not the case. Um, anyone doing frontline organizing has a double obligation, I feel, to effective self-criticism as well as to gracefully receiving criticism um, from other people in the movement and from other people in affected communities. Um, and so, you know, the positioning of confrontational organizing as the most desirable form of organizing and the disempowerment of like care work and community building um, is another, you know, major critique that I have. It seems to be kind of part of this mindset that righteous violence is self-justifying and I disagree fundamentally. Like I, I feel like um, the more confrontational um, and the more like leaning towards violent tactics that a person is using or that an organization is using, the more obligation they have to justify that. Um, and I'm again, I'm not dismissing any certain tactics. Like I'm not, I'm not coming out as like a pacifist or a nonviolent person necessarily, but I am saying that there is an obligation to be responsible to your community, accountable to your community, accountable to your actions, and to pursue other like other tactics and other options um, in addition to or before you get to the point of um, physical confrontation. And I feel like there's often not a sufficient effort to pursue other uh, tactical alternatives, even when tactical alternatives would actually be more effective. Um, you know, we have to consider the fact that there's a huge imbalance of power um, between anti-fascists and people of color and um, marginalized people in general and the state um, and fascist and white supremacist organizing. And so ultimately, you know, progress that is made um, will have to come from changing that relationship in, in ways that are not just through physical conflict. Another criticism that I have is I feel like there um, is often a failure to identify fascistic tendencies as a core element of whiteness um, and to direct efforts towards dismantling whiteness and dismantling colonialism. There's often this idea that white supremacy and more overt forms of white supremacy are the root of the problem and a failure to identify that whiteness and white supremacy are actually synonymous things. And in keeping with that, I feel like there is often also a major failure to effectively organize in allyship with indigenous communities. Um, and there's this kind of very white centric failure to identify colonialism as actually having a greater human impact than fascism and, you know, being while being driven by the same social forces. Um, and I'm not at all bringing that up to minimize the impact of fascism, to minimize the impact of the Holocaust, or to minimize the impact of fascistic policies um, taking place in the United States and in other places in the Western Empire right now. Um, but I feel like there is often, among white anti-fascists, a, fa a failure to engage in the human scope of the impact of colonialism in that, you know, close to a hundred million indigenous people were killed in the colonization of Turtle Island and that that genocide is ongoing. Um, not to mention, I'm not even personally aware of the numbers of indigenous people um, who were murdered um, in the colonization of Australia. I'm not aware of the numbers of people who died as a result of the transatlantic slave trade or the colonization of Africa or the colonization of India or the colonization of many other places in the world. Like the human impact of that the scope of the impact of it is truly astronomical, and I feel like it is kind of white-centric to focus on fascism as the most evil thing in the world, when I actually would argue that colonialism is potentially the most evil thing in the world, and that, fas that fascism is one manifestation of colonialism. It's an internally applied form of colonialism. And so I feel like we can like we really need to take that rage and that righteous anti-fascist energy um, and apply that more broadly to an anti-colonial movement in general that is fundamentally in allyship and accompliceship with 
indigenous struggles um and i feel like i haven't really like definitely that that does happen to a certain extent um often in like in individuals like individuals make that uh connection or do that allyship work but i feel like it's not something that is like fundamental to the anti-fascist movement in a way that i feel like it really needs to be um and so yeah all of those things being said i feel like really just overall like a tendency towards um self-righteousness or a resistance to self-criticism um and equating constructive and justice oriented critiques um with being reactionary or, op or oppositional um is a theme that really encompasses like a lot of my criticisms of the anti-fascist movement um and that's pretty much all i had to say off the top of my head of uh what my main criticisms were um i hope that you know this has been informative or beneficial in some ways and again i want to restate that i i do say this with love like i know that maybe it sounds like there's a bit of bitterness in my tone and how i talk about some of this but i'm also not trying to exempt myself from this like a lot of the things that i am saying are things that i have actually purpose or personally perpetuated such as you know getting myself involved in frontline direct action um against racism before i had personally um you know done a lot of internal anti-racism work um and that's something that i'm you know criti critical of myself as well critical of my comrades for and so i'm not coming from this from an or not coming at this from an external place i'm not coming at this from a you know all of you are doing something wrong and i'm fine <laughs> kind of way i'm coming at this from the perspective of a white anti-fascist um wanting to constructively criticize other primarily white anti-fascists to ensure that we are doing this work of moving towards justice in the most effective way possible um and so i hope that these criticisms will be received in that way um thank you for watching my video and again um i do have a patreon that i would really appreciate people to donate to if um you know you have any money to do that if you want to get your name on the end credits or if you want to receive some zines that i've made uh, you can sign up for that. Um, I also receive one-time donations through PayPal, and I'll link that in the description. Um, I'll also link, um, you know, some further reading links uh, and books about anti-fascism and de-radicalization work in the description. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I had to say. Thank you for joining me today. I hope all of you are well, um, and I'll see you next time. Peace out.